Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, week two. We are going to be talking about uh, genre this week. But first, the typical hello, Flannery. Uh, the typical rundown accessibility captions are going throughout this. Um, Miss Flannery. She's not an accessibility um, feature per se, but she shall probably go in and out of frame a couple of times um, because she's feeling very needy today. Uh, if there's anything I can do in the future to make things more accessible for you, let me know, okay? Uh, but right now I've got the captions going. If you have a question, uh, use the hand raise feature or put it in the chat. I've got the chat up. You can watch all of that as it goes by, and I will get to you as I come to the end of a thought, because if I try to interrupt myself mid-thought, um, it will just be badness. Uh, my, ADH brain, my ADHD brain cannot handle that, and we'll end up in tangents, areas that we did not need to be. Uh, late work. If you think you need any extra time whatsoever, please ask. All right. Uh, only one person asked last week, and I had to go in and like put a whole bunch of I'm gonna have to take 10 points off uh messages on assignments yesterday, and that really bummed me out. Um, so if you think you need extra time, just ask for it, right? Even if you don't end up needing it, just ask. Uh, and then office hours, office hours, this is y'all's time. I, my office hours are on my LMS profile. It should show up in your time zone if you have your time zones set up properly. Uh, I know that they are between 6 and 10 on the East Coast, which I believe is between 4 and 7 on the West Coast. I'm not 100%. I don't know. I'm, a, I'm in Florida. I rarely go out West and have to deal with time changes. Um, although. Uh, my hockey team's playing out west. Yeah, that's math, though. Um, <laughs> all I all I know is this week I'm going to be up late uh, two nights in a row watching hockey because my team's playing out west. Anyway, that's that. This week, uh, writing and audience engagement, uh, which is primarily genre is going to be our big focus this week okay because this is important all right this is kind of make or break in a lot of instances uh character is very important right and your character leads to your plot and such and such and such but um if you don't properly identify what genre you're working in, uh, one, people aren't going to be able to find your work. People that do find your work might get turned off by your work. They may look at it and be like, well, this isn't what I thought it was. I hate this. Um, and, and it just ends up being a mess. You end up with a lot of angry people, right? Um, so it's super important that you have a, a basic understanding of genre in general and an in-depth understanding of the genre in which you are working, okay? So like, for example, um, I finally read a Grady Hendrix book. Uh, which for someone who's a horror fan is like, why did this take me so long? Um, 
the answer is because I've been working on the dissertation and haven't read fiction in five years. But uh, I read We Sold Our Souls the other day. And for the first half of the book, I was getting really annoyed that this was sold and marketed to me as a horror novel because I'm just like, okay, well, when's it coming? What is horror about this? Yes, some people have died, um, but that was more of like a conspiracy uh, murder sort of thing, not really horror. It was more thriller feeling, right? Which is fine. You can mix genres. But in a 330 some odd page book, if there are zero elements of the genre in the first 150 pages, I'm putting a lot of faith in the last half of the book that it's going to it's going to be some scary shit right? There's going to be some demons, some devils, some occult, what have you. Um, and that's putting a lot of pressure on a writer or an artist or what have you, right? I personally didn't, and I ended up with mixed feelings about the book. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that for the first half of the book, I was wondering why this was in the genre it was, why it was being marketed as a horror book instead of a thriller or any other genre, right? Because there are certain expectations that you have when you go sit down to watch something or you pick up a book or you listen to an album, you expect certain things from certain genres, right? You expect horror to be scary. Uh, thrillers are gonna have a lot of chases. Romance books are gonna be cheesy. Romance stories are gonna be cheesy in general. Uh, that sort of thing. So, you... yes, Matt, what you got? Yeah, um, yeah. When it comes down to genres, uh, one of the a couple of big things, and this is where it really gets confusing sometimes, is and they've actually really started adding it in. Uh, you have this mix of genres, like you'll have uh, a comedy drama, mm -hmm. or you'll have, you know, a military drama, or uh, military horror, comedy horror, and now they've really started to come up with these different categories for them. So you really got to think to yourself, okay, it's not so much based off of uh, in particular dramas anymore, uh, like it was back in the day. Like, okay, I'm going off to the video store and I'm going to rent a horror movie or a comedy or an action movie. Uh, now it's so diverse uh, in the uh, genre uh, genre mindset that you could say, okay, well, I'm I'm looking for a comedy that's a mystery that has some action in it that you know has a, has a drama. It's just it's it's really getting confusing how they're starting to do things, but I can Nights really out. understand <laughs> it's exactly. Um, you know, and that actually, honestly, watching that halfway through it, I'm having to, I'm trying to think about what's going on, but thank goodness for, uh, DVR, I'm sitting there rewinding it and I'm trying to figure out, okay, I missed something here and I'm trying to go back, figure it out. Or it's like, if they read it, it's like Knives Out is the new version of Clue, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, but with all these different genres and everything going on, do we really classify anything based off of uh, the way it used to be? Like, you know, this is an action movie. Okay, great. So but it's an action movie that has like 
uh, drama that's that's equal to that of a romance. You know. So we do. So we do, and we don't. All right. So thank you very much for bringing that up because yeah, there's a lot more genre mixing uh, these days. Uh, I really think that to an extent there always was, but now with uh, streaming services and whatnot, uh, it's become even more obvious because you see what genres, what categories they're putting things in. But there's usually going to be one overarching genre for each piece of media, even if it ends up overlapping a bunch into different areas. There's going to be one genre that's trying to stay faithful to uh, in its storytelling. So like, uh, Knives Out, for instance, uh, is very much still a murder mystery story, uh, either one of the movies, even though it's dipping into various other genres as it's telling that story. There's still the one overarching genre, and it's important that you're able to identify that and that you know these genres because we are still sorting and finding the next thing that we want to watch or listen to or read based on what we've enjoyed before. So in the case of a streaming service or a Spotify or something like that, the algorithm has all of these things sorted by whatever genre they were told this thing is. So when it notices you like this genre, it's gonna suggest you more like that. And more. And if you like a uh, blend, like uh, I'm a real big Mel Brooks fan. So I, I, I ended up skewing my uh, horror section by watching um, Young Frankenstein one too many times. So now it's coming up with all of these comedy horror uh, films mixed in with my like serious horror movie stuff, which is fine because I happen to like that. But... And some people don't, and some people might get annoyed at uh, it being sorted that way. I think that is the reason, too, why uh, they've developed categories instead of listing things purely by genre in streaming services, so that they can make up these clever, quirky names for things that... Uh, are either a blend of genres or sit just outside of one genre, but not really in another. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I was looking at. And God bless you for love, Mel Brooks. He broke a lot of barriers, and uh, uh, he actually that's that's my generation right there. So, but um, we were all we were the Gen X. So, yeah. yeah. Anyways. Yeah, that's that's one thing I was looking at is all this mixture of genre. It really kind of puts that confusion in. And uh, like one of the assignments, it says pick a genre and talk on it. Well, I did the one I'm more familiar with. You know, the you know war and action stuff. Mm -hmm. So I talked about that. But you know, when I pulled up uh, because I've forgotten the name of a couple movies. When I pulled up for my discussion, just to reference uh, the names of some films um of the, of the movies that i know and some of the ones that i have criticized and picked apart like and you have no idea how how i will run them into the ground um but uh looking them up i noticed when i did that that a lot of them that pulled up were not they they say oh well this is a a war movie no it's not really a war movie oh well, this is an action movie not really that's a romance 
<laughs> so that uh, that will actually lead uh, nicely into uh, into my next slide. Uh, so there's a bit of genre confusion happening uh, with one of my favorite movies. Um, and I'm not going to tell you guys the name of the movie. I'm not going to tell you anything about the movie. I'm just going to show you the trailer. And then we can talk about it. Um, Blazing Saddles? No. Oh. No, it's more obscure than that. <laughs> All right. Monty I'm Python. Gonna, I'm going to turn off my video so that uh, y'all aren't just watching me watch this trailer. All right. Here we go. Turn off that here. And. Go on. Can y'all hear it? No, I can't hear. All right, hang on. Negative. All right, hang on. Mm, try this again. I think me using headphones screwed everything up. All right, let me know now if you can hear it. Yes, now. It doesn't really matter much what a man does with his life. What matters is the legend that grows up around him. Brian Slade was the wildest rock star to come out of London. The biggest saints and slides fatal. But that wasn't enough. We set out to change the world. What happened? Who did it? And why? Next week is the anniversary of the whole shooting incident. One journalist is about to look into the mystery. I'm going to contact you about a story. From the moment Brian Slade stepped into our lives, he knew they would be the same. He was, in the end, like missing Pew Pew. Right after everything crashed, Brian seemed to get lost in the lie. He was someone else. Duramax Films invites you to throw away your expectations and take a magical trip back to the 70s. When the glam scene rocked London, and the outrageous fashions, music, and behavior shocked the world. I knew I should get a sensation. So what, if y'all had to guess, <laughs> what genre would you say that movie was? You don't get to guess, Flannery. I would say drama. Drama, yeah, that's, that's good. It actually is, yeah. You guessed you guessed one of the correct genres. What else? Documentary? Yeah. Yeah, it has that feel in the trailer. The movie, not so much. Uh <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce it. I think it's like documentary drama. Docudrama. Docudrama. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not so much. If I mean, if you were, it's definitely yeah. It sort of gives you almost that mockumentary docudrama feel. Um, but then if you were to watch it and like compare it to a uh, best in show or um, this is Spinal Tap, very different movie, very different movie. For me, it gave sort of a mystery who done it feel in the trailer. Did y'all get that? With a little yeah, bit that, of comedy? That, 
Two of y'all at once. Yeah. yeah, he's right. It had that little bit of comedy in there, but it also had that that nineteen uh, eighties um, feel of like murder mystery, uh, almost like theater. I'm wanting to say. Yeah, yeah, it felt like a murder mystery. It felt like a oh, who done it? This is what this movie is about. We're gonna solve this crime. Um, I'm really glad that I did not see this trailer before seeing this movie, or it would have made me very upset because it is not that. Because I like murder mysteries, I really enjoy them. So if I had gone into this movie expecting, yeah, this is it. We're going to close this case. It's going to be awesome. Um, I would have been really disappointed. Instead, I just went into it after having, um, after having heard the soundtrack. And I really love the band Placebo. And Placebo are in the film they're on the soundtrack and in the film itself so I was like yeah I want to watch this this sounds awesome I love glam music I want to watch this movie and then when I saw the trailer I was like well yeah yeah Christian Bale's character is sort of like that's his assignment at the newspaper he works at but they're using the framework that they're using is Citizen Kane. I, I wouldn't call that a murder mystery either. Uh, I, I would think more along the lines of a Warren Beatty film. It's just a straight drama. Yeah, it, Rocket Man, Rocket Man uh, trailer compared to uh, this one, uh, when it from Elton John to Spinal Tap. That's that's two different. Uh, deals but the same year uh, the same decade but honestly I'd take Rocket Man over that any day well I like to use Velvet Goldmine as an example of um, how wrong marketing can go if there's any sort of genre confusion happening um it because they you put out a trailer like that you're marketing it to the wrong group of group of people they're going to end up feeling bamboozled by the end of it because it it's not a murder mystery at all for all that he is yeah his assignment at the newspaper is to find out what happened to Brian Slade, but that's not the real story. The real story is this romance um, between uh, three characters, between uh, Christian Bale's character and Ewan McGregor's character and Ewan McGregor's character and Jonathan Reese Myers' character. And then you got poor Tony Collette thrown in there. Uh, that's what it is. It's not who who cares in the end what happened when you've got all of the rest of the story happening. All right. So it's important to know what genre it is you want to be working in because that is where your focus should be for all of these little tropes that you're so used to seeing in films and in books and whatnot you need to know where to apply them and how to apply them right which means you need to be familiar with these things. But first, fiction versus nonfiction. This is the very building block, guys. But you would be surprised um, at how often people get this wrong. Uh, so 
Velvet gold mine. Do you think fiction or nonfiction? A mix of fiction. See, guys, this is why I like the hand raise. This is another reason why the hand raise so that you guys are both talking at the same time. A mix of both. Okay. So why do you say that? Because it's like actual events. So I would say like fiction. So I'm confused by that. Um, so you said you'd call it fiction because there are actual events? So like basically like I'll say it's like it's a referring to like actual people in events. So you would call that fiction? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm very glad we did this. Um, because referring to actual people and events is nonfiction. Uh, things that are made up is fiction. So, so you I'm know, sorry, this, I'm sorry, I got those mixed up. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, that happens. And that's why I'm glad that we're doing this. Um, so, you know, the saying fact or fiction, right? Fiction is things that are made up. But uh, we tend to have a problem with, uh, with in particular, movies like uh, Velvet Goldmine, where people don't know where to place it if you're not savvy on the breakdown between fiction versus nonfiction. So Scott and Matt, y'all had thoughts. Y'all can rock, paper, scissors. I'll go ahead. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um I was saying mix of both because it has mystery, meaning uh fiction and comedy uh, for nonfiction. Okay. Um, uh, so, so what I'm looking at is this is nonfiction. It does have that hint of mystery about it, but you know, in life itself, through our everyday lives, through their everyday lives, uh, including that of a celebrity, there's always a sense of mystery of what's going on. There's always questions about where am I going next? What's happening here? Um, and there's always somebody, you know, starting some form of drama that they got to figure out. So, yeah, I, I see that as happening in real life. Um, and as far as the rest of it, I do see, you know, there is some, there's actually really uh, a lot of room during these types of things for, um, uh, creative play uh in in lieu of the writers uh but at the same time they want to try to keep it as accurate as possible uh, if you got the right writers of course um so uh yeah honestly i see this as being a complete non-fiction uh with just maybe a hint here and there of not real but real okay Does that makes okay. sense Great. I am so glad that we decided to do this. Um, this is 100% fiction. So I think there's this hang up and I'm not sure where it's from, but I've noticed it um, over the last uh, year or so that I've been here at LA Film School um, of people thinking that um, because something can happen, that that makes a piece nonfiction. And that's not the case. Uh, you can have hyper-realistic fiction, right? And you can have some nonfiction that you're like, really, that was, that was for real? So what makes, what differentiates the two is did this actually happen? Did this happen somewhere in the real world? All right. So 
there's a rumor about Velvet Goldmine that it was originally supposed to be a uh, David Bowie biopic. Um, and if you and if you look at the writing and look at the characters, you can see where people would come to believe that the main character is very much like Bowie. Uh, there are all sorts of parallels between um, Tony Collette's character and Bowie's first wife, but it's not. And even if it were, it's a highly fictionalized one. They're just taking like bare bones of, okay, well, this happened. This might be cool to play with. Let's do that. All right. As opposed to something like Rocket Man, which is for all of its fantastical elements, it's a freaking musical for crying out loud. And they treat it like a stage musical. It's nonfiction. Because these are all things that actually happen to Elton John throughout his life. Okay. I, you can have, you can have mystery that's nonfiction, right? That's typically true crime stuff that would fall under the category of mystery. I, I tend to work in both and when I work in fiction, I do sometimes draw inspiration from my life, but I'm taking this moment and I'm asking myself, okay, well, what if what if X, Y, and Z thing happen? I'm hugely exaggerating elements of my life in order to put them in a fictional scenario. So for example, I'm gonna have this video up for y'all. Um, by the end of the week, but um, I'm starting to do all of the uh, all of the background work, all of the character building, world building for this um, this sort of horror dark fantasy novel, and I was one of the things that inspired me to write it was. Um, the death of my cousin, he, uh, I know he was shot and I know nothing else about what happened. I don't know the circumstances surrounding the shooting, nothing. All I know is that is the official cause of death, right? So, that leaves me with a lot of room to play as bad as as bad as that sounds. It leaves me with a lot of room to, okay, well, what if I know I know all of these facts I could put together a somewhat believable story about what happened in my own head to sort of, you know, help grieve and come to terms with what happened. But what if I want to make it something completely fantastic with like monsters and whatnot? Because I can, because I don't know, right? This is giving me a chance to answer the question of, I know this never happened, there's no way this is what actually happened, but what if? if that makes any sense whatsoever. <laughs> I, on the other hand, in my nonfiction, 
I'm taking inspiration from real life events. And then I'm just telling you exactly what happened. I'm telling the story exactly as it happened. I'm not going, okay, well, what if this thing were different about it? I'm not saying, I'm not trying to answer that question like I am with this uh, novel that I'm starting, right? My nonfiction piece I just finished, I'm straight up just telling people the story of this relationship. And I intercut it in creative ways with um, some of my research uh, from my dissertation because the relationship all happened while I was in grad school. But there's nothing, nothing, no way in which it deviates from what actually happened going on. Does that sort of make sense? How, so like something like Titanic, the Titanic actually existed, but the movie is fiction. Yeah, it does make sense. Um, and I can see where you're at with that. Um, because I've written, I wrote something uh, that was built up in my mind for the longest time uh, from stuff I was in the military. And that's my screenplay that I wrote. And one of the things, and I think it might, I might have been uh, torpedoing myself on this one. Uh, but one of the things that I think has stopped me from getting it sold is the fact that I keep telling people these are smoke stories told by soldiers. You know, we're sitting around a smoke pick. We're, we're, we're you know, having, having a, a cigarette, you know, just chilling out uh, for break and whatnot. And these are different stories told by soldiers. And it's all put together into one giant timeline. Um, and that... And it's completely fiction, but it's based off of nonfiction. So um, that's one of the biggest things I think that's been getting me is everybody thinks, oh, well, this isn't really real, but yet it is real and they can't wrap their head around it. You know? Yeah. In, in, yeah. Inspired by real events. Sort of. Exactly. Thing. So, yeah. yeah. And it, like, but it has that, it has that sense of, and the problem is, is, and I'm going to backtrack here a little bit. The problem is with a lot of the dialogue in it, it's a lot of one-liners, you know, direct to the point. Uh, nothing that like beats around the bush and goes five times around the uh, city center before you realize what's going on. This is a straight direct to the point, one-liners. Uh, it's the way the military talks. It's the way we're all, we've been taught to talk. You know, if I want to get something out, say it straight, I'm going to say it straight and that's it. You know, I ask a direct question. I want a direct answer. I don't want anything else. I don't want a beat around the bush five different times before you finally say no. You know, this is that's that's how I wrote it. And I don't think they can really a lot of people really can't wrap their heads around it. Um, but it is based off of uh, the war in general. But it's set in two different um, theaters. I got mm. it set one end set in Iraq where they where they first start out, and the final is set in Afghanistan. But in between, there is a lot of uh, I wouldn't say personal, but it's because it's all team driven, and that's how we operate. We operate as a team, not as you know, these two guys are going to go over here and do this, you know, on their own. They're going to go on a mission on their own. No, that never happens. Um, unless it's a special op mission and the recon and the scouts and, you know, SF and stuff like that. But um, this is all 17. So it's actually a whole team loses and they're all feeling it, but it's all drawn to one person, the one person they consider, you know, the dad of the platoon, the big daddy of the platoon uh, was the platoon sergeant himself, and he's feeling it, but the character doesn't let it 
known off the bat. He can't show that weakness to his soldiers. So it's it's kind of a you'd have to read it to understand it, but it kind of shows that you know at the end um, they all pull together and despite what their higher chain of command says or despite what um, the orders say, they all pretty much give the one finger salute and say, nope, we're going to do this. Bye. See you later. You know, bust through the gate and go rescue whoever they got to rescue. You know? Sounds good. Uh, real quick, let's go over different genres and different expectations of them the big genres and the big expectations that y'all have so horror you expect it to be somewhat scary dark and grim right if it's not these things mm, you were probably questioning like i was with this grady hendrix book like why why did you tell me that this is a horror book or a horror film or what have you right action adventure you've got a quest someone is looking for something uh it's normally going to be very fast paced right i felt like i i felt like uh the beginning of we sold our souls or like the uh the space sort of the middle of the first half of the book felt more action adventure e because of the pacing of it. Um, it's normally going to be some sort of fights, shootouts, what have you. Science fiction, time travel, TARDIS, woo uh, aliens, space. Um, but also, um, everything, everywhere, all at once, uh, that's science fiction, uh, the multiverse, uh, multiversal travel, um, that's another one that's become big in sci-fi. I love that movie too. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Um, romance. Guys could probably pick a romance out at five paces. You got your, your meet cute, your misunderstanding. Someone falls in love with someone else. Um, I remember I knew a girl in undergrad who was under contract from um, Harlequin to write a book. And they like gave her... Like, okay, they have to meet by this chapter. They have to kiss by this chapter. They have a formula for this shit, all right? There's no messing around with the romance genre. Uh, it is by far the most easily recognizable, I think, right? I highly recommend uh, you making a bookmark for this website, tvtropes.org. Um, it can end up being one of those rabbit hole sites like Wikipedia, where you just keep clicking. Um, but it can also be uh, highly useful. So you can search... Uh, you can search films, books, TV shows, what have you. You can search by genre. Um, and it will tell you all of the tropes, all of the things that uh, people expect from that genre. They've got even a special section called So You Want to Write. So you want to write horror, so you want to write sci-fi, so you want to write this. And it gives you a short little breakdown of, okay, here are the audience expectations for those genres. What's up, Matt? Just say it's addictive. It's not a rabbit hole, it's addictive. I've been on it. You can't get off of it. I was on it for five hours. You cannot get off of it. 
I love it so much. One of my favorite comedians, they have a page just for her. And I'm just going, why does Eddie Izzard have a page on TV tropes? I mean, well deserved, but also. I mean, the, Eddie Izzard, come on now, really? She has a oh, page. He, There's a page for all of her specials. Eddie Izzard is, oh, it's, it's, it's no explanation behind it. That That is. Okay, I'm not gonna, we're gonna be here for hours. I'm not gonna just start with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be posting an Eddie video to uh, the discussion board later. Um, an, an old one from the 90s. Yeah, for those of y'all that don't know Eddie Izzard, ever since like the 80s, Eddie Izzard has been, it's, it's, <laughs> beyond even comprehension it, it, it's a he's a it's he she, it's a mind twister okay she's, she's the missing python that's beyond that it's it's yeah. this is like characters beyond characters beyond characters this is like the the multiverse of characters in there all right and i think so the biggest thing they did was oceans the, the ocean series that was perfect in that yeah uh she's also in velvet gold mine um okay uh trying to decide we have time for this or not i think i'm gonna say no and we will just talk about the assignments so I think you guys have a fairly good grasp. Um, but hang on. I want to go over your assignments. So I'm going to turn these captions back on. And I'm going to. I have a question. Yes. Um, for our assignments for last week, when are those going to be finished grading? Uh, so the grades uh, will be done by uh, Wednesday night. Okay. So yeah, um, normally you would have more grades in by now, but yesterday was MLK day. So um, I had the day off and I <laughs> used it as a day off uh, for once. Okay, uh, da -da, preview. All right, I am going to post uh, two things on the discussion board. One is an example of how the discussion board post should look. And the other is the Eddie Izzard video. I'm gonna post both of those things to the discussion board as soon as class is done. Um, but your other assignments for the week, you've got another grammar assignment, and then, where's my share screen? Share screen. And then you have this. 2.4, the anatomy of a story project, okay? So for this, you are going to use whatever it was that you picked for 1.4 and you're gonna keep working on it for this one. Okay, so in my class, you had these choices of the three poems by Jillian Vaisa, Alice, my story, and then AD's uh, spoken word. So you're going to write a paragraph summarizing the story in which you will identify the introduction rising action, climax, falling action, and conclusion of the story. Okay, um, the big thing here, we're not looking for, did you hit this perfectly? I'm looking for, and what the other instructors are looking for is, can you explain to me why you said this is the introduction, this is the conclusion, 
this is the falling action, that sort of thing, okay? So if you haven't already, please look at the um, video I made uh, for assignment 1.4, it's in the announcements, uh, where I go over how to pull evidence from the text, okay? Uh, because you're going to need to do it here as well, all right? You're going to need to tell me why this is the introduction. Why is this the rising action and so on and so forth? Make sense? So you can do that. Turn it in. Bada bing, bada boom. That's it. Okay? Big thing, first thing you want to make sure you do, though, is uh, make sure you have your discussion board post due on time, all right, so that uh, no points come off for that. If, if you end up not being able to do it on time, then that's fine. You can still post it uh, as long as it's up by the Sunday deadline. Just make sure that you are, you know, actually doing what's asked of you. Okay. So, like I said, I'm going to post an example uh, as soon as we're done here. And if you guys have already made your post and you see the example and are like, oh, I didn't quite do this uh, exactly the way she asked go edit it. That's completely fine. Okay. Um, you're, you can do that. All right. Uh, that's why I'm going to post this. Any questions? Yes. Okay. So for the, uh, 2.2, the discussion, um, one of the things I did was I went back and I referenced because naturally, as you can tell, I, I do I'm more into war and action stuff. One thing it is, I went back to reference uh, a certain film uh, and compared it to the well, I can't negatively say certain things about certain films because they were all pretty much on point. Um, other ones I could tear apart like crazy. Um, and one of the things I did is there's no real one way to say, OK, well, you know, this is good, but you can't compare it to this that, and the other, because when it comes to those types of films, it's hard to say this film is exactly like this one or this. One. But when it comes to uh, films that are based off of real life events, uh, getting the details and getting the, uh, you know, everything just right is how I did mine. Um, the dial from the dialogue, equipment, gear, uniform, everything, uh, including the actions uh, they took. Uh, and this is all based off of the book, which is based off of, and because a lot of the films they make when it comes to you know, what really happens based off books nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's all based off of uh, what people there uh, said. Well, this happened when we were in, it was, and it was uh, collaborated by other people who said the same thing that were there. So that was, that's really hard to do in those kinds of films. Um, but I want to know is if you can't say, okay, well, this is wrong about this and this film. I can't, and I can compare it to this film with the exact same thing in a different in a different genre. You know, uh, is it okay to say, you know, do what I did and say, okay, well, it's you know, some films are good, but because of this, they'll never compare to this. Yeah, that's. I'm trying to find this because I think I'm I'm just going to show you guys. Yeah, because I mean, when I go That's back and I look at it. Yeah, I think I'm just going to show you guys. I'm still going to post this, but I think I'm also going to um, show it to you now. 
if yeah, you guys I can't compare there's no way to compare like black hawk down to hurt locker right That's like two completely so, different uh, hurt locker i could tear apart so here uh so here's the example that i came up with um it's horror surprise um <laughs> it's uh so identify both the genre and the media that you chose okay well i picked horror and i picked the entirety of the vampire chronicles by anne rice because i wanted to be extra like that okay so then the prompt explain in detail how similar or not similar it is to other media in that genre what that's asking is what sort of tropes are being used in this film that either are or film or book or what have you in this case i was looking at the books um not the um film and tv adaptations but what tropes are being used here in this example that aren't being used other places or that are being used other places so uh yours doesn't have to be as <laughs> uh as rigorous as mine here but just as an example um Anne Rice's novels change the horror genre that being said she did have to rely on pre-existing tropes in order to get audiences to go along with uh her new take on vampires so then I go into uh the labels that they use on tvtropes.org uh one of them is face of an angel mind of a demon which is creating characters like Armand and Claudia who were both turned vampires at very young ages and describing them as cherubric or like a china doll but them being the most uh the most fearsome of the vampires in this series like these are the dangerous ones these are the ones to look out for is Armand and Claudia who look like they couldn't hurt a fly all right then you've got uh she played a bit with the trope um I love you vampire son um which the name of it is a heathers reference if you it, anyway um after Lestat turns his lover into a vampire he kind of hates him he kind of hates Nikki from then out um and the same sort of thing happens with Armand and Daniel um but then there's the there are examples of that trope uh actually being used the way it was intended where Louis and Lestat's relationship by the end by the time Anne Rice died she had written their wedding for crying out loud okay so that's just sort of what we're asking for is can you identify tropes in this genre and can you tell me how they've been used um both in this piece of media and in others yeah and i have kept y'all like five minutes late um i do apologize uh to those of you who had other plans <laughs> tonight I am going to go ahead and thank you all for coming and end the recording. So feel free if you have somewhere to be to leave. Thank you very much for coming. Um, if you still have questions, uh, you can stick around and ask. Okay, I've got a couple minutes um, before I need to go that I can answer some more questions. All right. Have a Thank good you. one. Have a good one. See you later. Bye.